got what's on the outline. So. And we've looked at, we're exam remember, we're doing a self-examination of our faith. And I'll be done with this probably within a couple weeks, but I don't know what I'm going to teach. If you have any ideas, tell me. But, uh, and the way, so what we've decided is that uh, we need to glorify God. And the first way to glorify God, and this has to be first, is that you confess Jesus, okay, as your Lord and Savior. Okay? Does that make sense? Got to do that first. And then what's the second one? What's the second one? It's not on your outline. And we need to aim our life at His glory. Okay? And do you remember? Okay, so... You got to confess Jesus Christ. If you're going to, you're going to listen. Six. Sinners that don't know the Lord have no opportunity to glorify God. Okay? Can't. Zero. Even the most moral of people that don't know God cannot glorify God. Their acts, their their works are as if they're uh, trash to Him. Okay? So if you're going to glorify God. And that's the aim of our faith, really, is to glorify God. If you're going to do that, first of all, you have to confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have to come to know God. And then you have to aim your life at His glory. And remember, we talked about that. We said that to aim your life at His glory means that you do what He wants you to do, irrespective of what you want to do. That in all things, in all ways, you always glorify God. Okay? So... Then the third way, which we began talking about two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, when you all kind of disconnected on me, you glorify God by confessing your sin. Okay? And you, I don't know, I don't know how often you've heard that taught, but you glorify God by confessing sin. So, uh, I want to review a little bit, and then I'm going to talk to you in earnest about the confession of sin. But one of the greatest expressions of humility you have available to you is to confess your sin. Uh, oftentimes, we become too busy to bother to acknowledge our own sin. So uh, we sort of figure we're... we're we're, we figure, we figure, we rationalize our own mind. Well, I'm pretty good most of the time. You ever done that? Yeah. I have. I'm pretty good most of the time. So I'm going to excuse my sin today. Uh, there's no sense dragging myself through that dirt and that grime. Uh, <clears throat> but the problem with that theology, the problem with that thought process, is when you ex exercise that thought process, you fail to glorify God. And you hurt yourself, but you fail to glorify God. So, if you remember, we were in Joshua 7. And you can go there if you want. You don't have to, but uh, that's where we're going to begin. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in Genesis 3. I'm going to look at a couple of things tonight. But uh, And God's saying to his people in Joshua 7, as they began their conquering of the promised land, he, he in essence says, don't gather anything up. Remember? I don't want you to haul any of their stuff away. I don't want you to leave anything there. Why? Because they're a society that God wants them to have nothing to do with them because if they do, God knows what will happen. What will happen to them? They'll, they'll be corrupted. They'll fall into idolatry. So God says, uh, leave them alone. And remember we said Achan... Achan was aching to steal. That's the way you, I remember Achan. Achan was aching to steal stuff. And he took some of the things out of one of the cities they conquered. 
And of course, as a result, they were defeated at the next city. So Achan is confronted in 719, right, by Joshua. And Joshua says to Achan, my son, he says, listen to what he says, my son, I pray thee, he doesn't tell him to confess. What does he tell him? He says, the first thing he tells him is, give glory to the Lord God of Israel. That's what he tells him. Okay? And then does it, and then how does he tell him to do it? By making confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done, hide it not from me. And Achan answers Joshua and says, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus and I've done this and that. So Joshua says to him, Give glory to the God of Israel by making confession of sin. <laughs> so that verse says it glorifies to confess your sin. Am I correct? Okay. You glorify God by the confession of your sin. So, uh, to it, it, in the first part of the uh, confession is acknowledging the sin. You, when you acknowledge sin, you glorify God. So then, what happens in verse 24? Joshua and all the other people, they take out Achan. Uh, and they, they take all the stuff that they took. And they take his sons and daughters, his animals. It's like a, it's a spirit, it's a picture of a spiritual cleansing. Everything they took out of the, of the, uh, the Valley of Achor. Uh, they, they, they take all this stuff and Joshua says, why have you troubled us? And then he says, these are bad words to hear. The Lord shall trouble you today. That's a bad thing to hear. So, uh, and notice, Achan confesses sin, but what happens to his chastisement? It's still appropriate. There's always a consequence to sin. Uh, so, uh, uh, he, he, the confession is, is good, but the chastening is still going to come. So what happens? All of Israel stones him and his family, because his family is complicit in his guilt. Because they knew he stole, told, stole that stuff because they, I believe they saw it in their tent. And they didn't go and tell uh, Joshua. So they're complicit, so the whole family gets uh, wiped out. Yeah. So if the wife knew that he stole it, Yeah. That's not subservience. Him. Allowing your husband to live in sin isn't subservience. Oh, you should have gone. That's what happened to Adam and Eve. Oh, you are. Oh, you are. You become yeah. complicit. Yeah. Yeah. We have that issue oftentimes with our children. Yeah. We, 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 have, we allow them to live in sin. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you can, do, you can do some yeah, stuff to them to motivate them in a proper way. <laughs> we allow them to live in sin, and what we do is. Because we don't want we don't want to confront that sin, so we just turn a blind eye to it. it used to happen a lot in the school where I used to work, and uh, it's a it's not a good thing because you know what happens when uh, sin sin breeds sin. It's as old as the it's as old as the Bible is. So God is going to teach Israel a lesson, and what's the lesson? By, what's, the, what's the lesson he shows them by Achan? Don't, don't, don't disobey me. I told you not to take anything from those people. You did it. And if you're going to disobey me, there's going to be severe consequences. And uh, Achan and his family, they all are, they are, all, all are stoned, and they, they heap up the stones, and they call it a place, Acre, which yeah. means Acre, which means trouble. It's a place of trouble. So why, why did God want Achan to confess his sin? To acknowledge that he did wrong. Amen. See, this is a very important concept that we oftentimes don't hang on to. If Let's just say God smites Achan with some other consequence to his sin. 
and Hagen appears to be a godly man, what happens? God appears to be an ogre. God appears to be unjust. And see, that's the problem. That's the problem with uh, when, when, when Christians allow the infestation of sin in their lives, they, they, per, they portray a picture to the world that is inappropriate as, as it pertains to who God is. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you allow sin in your life that you don't confess because you want to hang on to it, because you want to do what you want to do rather than what God wants you to do, and He chastises you, then the world sees you, hey, that person's a Christian. Why is God allowing that to happen to them? And it's not everything, but you better hang on to your, your, your boots because it's a lot of stuff. It really is. I'm sorry, but it's a lot of stuff. So, uh, Achan was to confess his God so that God would, the people would see that God is just and holy and righteous in his punishment. And he, God, see, God is free to chasten whomever he desires to chasten. Now, you may not have thought confession of confession that way before. But I've thought about confession that way since I was a, a baby Christian. Because that's the way I was taught as a baby Christian. And the reason God wants Achan to confess is so that God can be free to chasten him and not have anybody think that that chastening is undeserved. God is just, right? And God understands the mentality of man. And he wants people to understand how he functions within the lives of the within the lives of his people. Uh, he doesn't want it to appear that he is just picking on people. God is holy. Listen, if you have sin in your life, if God doesn't react to that sin, he's a liar. I'm sorry, but he is. So is that possible? So what does that mean? God has to react to the sin in your life. I believe most of my physical maladies are tied to sin in my life. You may not. You may not understand that. I do. Between me and God, I do. Yeah. So, it's important that we understand that concept so that we can give the world a view of God that they deserve and that He most definitely so that they understand who our Father is. You know, in verse 20, Achan said, I have sinned against the... Achan makes a very appropriate confession. In verse 20, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. See, what we want to do, what we want to do with our maladies, with our problems of our life is, we want to uh, blame circumstances, we want to blame environment. We want to blame other things rather than accept our own responsibility. See, you have to, listen, if you want to exercise your faith to its full potential, you have to one day or another decide, am I going to make my actions glorify God or am I going to glorify what I want to do? Am I going to glorify me, or am I going to glorify he? And you, that's, that's the bottom line for the process of sanctification. Anything you do that brings discredit to the Lord doesn't glorify him. It can't. And it doesn't, and listen to me, it doesn't matter how you see it. It only matters how he sees it. How his, how his word sees it. Your body is his temple. What are you supposed to do with it? You're supposed to take care of it. Anything you do to harm yourself is, it, it, is a sin in the Lord's eyes, in my mind. So, so we have to, be, as people of God, we have to be, decide who and how we want to be. You draw the line. And then live your life that way. If you want to be an exemplary Christian who sanctifies himself in holiness each and every day,
then get after it. But if you just want to be one of those baby mediocre Christians, go ahead. But I, I would just assume you hide your faith because you harm my, my Savior every time people look at you and they wonder how can that be a Christian. I know that ain't nice. I know that's not. You're not going to hear that in a lot of places, but it's the truth in my mind. Mediocre Christians do, do the Lord a great deal of disservice because they have not been able to put themselves aside. So, so in the, in, in, when you consider your sin, you cannot dishonor God when you're ready to confess it. You, because the only just judgment for sin is God's chastisement. Okay? Listen, Satan wants you to live in your sin, doesn't he? He wants you to be complacent. He wants you to accept your own inadequacies. He wants you to be like that. When it, but whenever you excuse that sin, there you go. When you excuse your sin, you blame God for it. And I'm going to show you how. Genesis 3. You blame God when you when you accept your own sin. You end up blaming God. And we have a classic illustration of that. Genesis 3. You'll remember Eve sins, Adam sins. They sin. And then God comes to Adam. And uh, you know, you you hear I hear a lot of guys teach this, and they said, Well, Adam blamed Eve. No, I didn't. Never blamed Eve. What's he say? Well, uh, God goes, yeah. God goes looking for him, and he says, "It's the women, the woman you gave me." <laughs> so who's he blaming? Blame God. He blames God. Every time you allow, whenever you and willingly accept the sin that's in your life. If you're saved, you understand every sin that's in your life. Right? If you're saved. I do. I know where, I, where my walk with the Lord is. Deep. Whenever you are accepting of that sin and fail to confess it, you blame God. You know, what did, what did Adam say? Well, you gave me this woman. You know, I went to sleep a bachelor. I woke up. I was married. <laughs> I didn't. Even, I didn't even get a choice. You didn't even let me choose. You know, you could have picked any woman. Why did you give me her? She's a loser. <laughs> you should have picked a better woman for me. But that's none of that rationalization works. Uh, but by not willing to blame ourselves, see, sin has to. Sin has, a, has to have a place of placement. Sin, in your own life, you either decide you're going to accept it, or you're going to, uh, and by accepting, impinge God, uh, His character, or you're going to get rid of it and glorify God. So Adam is a good illustration of the exact opposite we're supposed to do. Giving glory to God means that I'll accept my responsibility for my sin. It isn't God's fault. It's not the fault of somebody that God brought into my life. It's not the fault of my circumstances. You know, you can't say because of, you can't say, well, you, well, you, you are the one that made Lucifer. You can't say that. That's not a, that's not appropriate. You, you're the one that let him fall from heaven. None of those things. You know, uh, you you can't say, well, you put me in this city. You put me in this position. You made my relationships this way. You didn't bring the right person in all across my path, or you brought the wrong person across my path. You're the one that's sovereign. You're in control. Why'd you let these things happen to me? You don't get to say that. Because it doesn't work. It's not true. Excusing sin disputes who God is. God has no... God has no tolerance for sin. If you sin, whose fault is it? It's yours. Yours and yours alone. So if God chooses to chasten us, he's free to do that. If you can't deny, that's his responsibility. And 
if you allow sin to run your life, you stymie your ability to grow closer to God. And as you consciously, openly face the reality of your sinfulness and confess it, you can, you can do things that can cause you to grow immensely in the Lord. Uh, see, Hebrews 12 talks about us running this race. Paul talks about running race. But when you run a race, what do you try? What do, what do track stars do? Do they go out when they're getting ready to go out and run the hundred yard dash? Do they do they lay on like fifteen or twenty pounds in a backpack and put it on their back? They train. They don't. They wear. Have you seen guys run track nowadays? They wear these outfits. They're almost obscene. They're so. <laughs> the guys and the girls both. They wear these Velcro things that cut through the air. They have no encumberments in their race. You know what? You're supposed to have no encumberments in your spiritual race. Because the race, the race ain't easy to begin with. So when you carry, you know, I, I've used that analogy a lot of carrying that baggage through the airport. You know, some of us got those little two-wheelers that are real, real nice, easy to pull on. Others have got these foot lockers with them chain attached to them and there's a little train behind that pulling on this bag. <laughs> We've got to get rid of all that baggage. And the only way you get rid of that baggage is you confess it and you get victory over it. Now if you can't get victory over it, then you're in spiritual bondage. And if you're in spiritual bondage, then you have to do other things. You have to be willing to fight it with spiritual warfare. That's another that's another old that's another old subject matter. But the confession of sin See, if you, lie, if you have sin in your life, sin pulls you down. And we need, we need to deal with sin in our life, and that's an important thing. If we acknowledge our sin, as we face our sin, as we confess our sin, then those weights drop off us and we can really begin to grow. So, I'm going to talk to you now about what I started to talk to you about last time, and I think I'll have enough time. Uh, the confession of sin from an individual and corporate perspective. Augustine of Hippo, if you're familiar with Augustine of Hippo, he was, he was very influential in the development of what we would call Western Christianity. He wrote a book, The City of God, and he wrote a book called Confession, which is a very good book. If you try to read them, make sure you get them in the up-to-date up vernacular. He said, in his book, Confession. The confession of evil works is the beginning, is the first beginning of good works. The confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. At the heart of God, then, is the desire to give and forgive, right? Yeah. And that's what happens in the redemptive process that ends up with the cross and then the resurrection. God's, God's love and his desire to forgive is what took Jesus to the cross, right? That's, that, was, that was the en energy that drove that engine. And the redemptive process is a great mystery that's hidden in the heart of God. We understand it to a degree. We don't understand all of it. But we know it's true. Why? First of all, because the Bible says it's true. Secondly, because I've seen the redemptive process affect on people's lives. And thirdly, because I've witnessed it in my own life. So I know it's true. And it's upon this ground that we can know that confession and forgiveness are realities, okay? God wants to forgive. And without the redemption of the cross, confession would... See, that's what... What do people go to psychiatrists for? To confess. What's the, as that person lays on the sofa, what's the psychiatrist trying to get them to do? To talk about the root of their problems. That's all they're doing. They're trying to get them to confess. And then if they can get them to confess, what do they, they do? They develop a plan to fix them. See, confession is, is therapeutic in any environment. The thing about confession in the spiritual environment is that it has, a, 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 it has an ingredient that is way beyond just pure therapy. It has an ingredient that causes us to get closer to Christ. Now you may be thinking, I thought 
Christ on the cross and redemption deal with salvation, and it does. But the salvation that the body speaks to, speaks of, refers to far more than just those who come to faith in Christ and go to heaven. The Bible believes, the Bible teaches that salvation is, and I've taught this lots of times, it's an event followed by an action. It's a noun and it's a verb. Okay? You think about it, faith is the same way. Faith is a noun, faith is a verb. And that's why Paul could say in 2 Philippians 12, he could say, work out your own salvation. Can you save yourself? So he isn't talking about the event, is he? He's talking about the actions. Work out your own salvation. And then in, uh, Ephesians 4.13 talks about the idea that the believer can grow into, quote, mature manhood to the measure of the stature. Listen to this. You can grow into mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's holy. You can mature, you can grow into mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13. How are we doing in that? Okay. So, then, how can we, how can, because this was the sticking point the other night, how can confession be thought of as a corporate discipline? Really? That's the sticking point. How do you expect me to confess to people in my church? Isn't because you most people have been taught that confession is a very private matter. You know why? You know how you get people get that idea? Because they go to the church in its early years, you know how people confess? They went into these little boxes. They still do it some churches to this day. That's why confession is private. Not because it's in the Word of God, the Word of God being private. Because all you have to do is read James. You don't get to, you don't get to exclude what you don't like, folks. And what does James say? James 16. And you can, you can put any spin, you can say those words mean anything you want. James 5, 16. What does it say? So you can't even pray for one another unless you know what the other person's sin is. And we don't want to tell anybody what our sins are. How are you going to pray for one another? How am I going to pray for your victory over sin if I don't know you have that sin in your life? We want to be so elemental, so elementary is the word I, think I wanted to say in our approach to confession. And that's what, the, that's what all the churches around you do. They treat it just like that. We don't need to confess our sins to one another because they, they, they look at they look at uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2.1. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Well, there's one mediator. That's not even talking. See, when, when Scripture says two things about the same thing, if you believe that the idea of him being your mediator means... He's your receiver of your confession. When it says two things about the same thing, you know what that means in Scripture? It means they're both true. You can't exclude either one. That's why, you, that's why when, you, when you examine uh, Calvinism and Armenianism, you can't exclude either one. There's a truth to both of them. Well, in Scripture, when you have both, both are found in Scripture, so neither one of those two can exclude the other. Yes, Confession of sin is private. Yes, confession of sin is corporate. See, confession is difficult for us because we all too often view the church. We think we're a fellowship of saints. Got news for you. We're a fellowship of sinners. The only thing, the only thing different between us and the people out in the world is the calling on our lives. We're sinners. 
We have a basic nature that leads us to sin. <clears throat> if you've conquered sin, you can't be here tonight. If you've conquered sin, you have to be gone. The Lord has to have called you home, home if you've conquered sin. Because you're living a life of glory. And you can't live a life of glory when you're in a world of sin. You know, Satan tricks us. We, 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 Satan tricks people into thinking that everybody else around us is so holy that we are alone in our sins. That's a bunch of hogwash. That's why I tell you about who and I. I am not I am not, I am not who I should be in the Lord tonight, I can tell you. I have sin in my life that needs to be dealt with. And you know what? I try to deal with it every day. And I'll have sin in my life that needs to be dealt with tomorrow. This is a problem. Nowhere in the word does it say Christianity is easy. But we want to say a few words and say, I'm done. But it's not, it's, that's, that's not the way it was designed. You know, we don't want to reveal to each other our failures. But if we could recognize the fact that the people of God are, first of all, a fellowship of sinners, then we would be able to hear the unconditional call of God's love and confess openly before our brothers and sisters. Yes, I said, confess openly. You know, I sat in here the other night, and I, I'm not going to demean anybody, but the words I heard on the reasons why we shouldn't confess sins to each other all had one thing in common. Self. Yeah. So, you know, I know I'm not alone in my sins, but it's fear and it's pride that causes us to segregate our, ourselves from each other. And that's exactly the way Satan wants you to live. He wants you to be fearful. You know, I've told you before, I've been in a church where a, a church leader got up, in front of, got up in front of that church and confessed his sin to everybody. And it was a dastardly sin. And you know what happened? That church went to a level, a level of holiness that I've only experienced that time. One time. One time. And within two years it was gone. Satan get back in. But for a short time, the people in that church were actually able to do it the way God wants it done. So, this example, uh, this example of confession that leads a church, that when that happens, then you have a church that's open to admitting its sin to each other and it reaches a level of, high, of holiness that's desired by many but achieved by, through, by few. So let's get down to the basics. How do, how, does, how do you go about confessing? Why should, what, what, should, what should be your thought process as you begin the process of confession? Well, you, you, should be, you should be willing and able to confess because God first loved you. Okay? That should be the first re re reason. And the evidence of His mercy and grace should touch your heart in such a way 